So before we get started, I kind of wanted to talk to you guys about um, how Factual uh, started working with Node. Um, so about a year and a half ago, uh, my boss said, all right, we need to get serious with our API. Our API takes about 150 milliseconds uh, to return. So um, I want that down to 30 milliseconds. So I was like, fine, um, we're probably going to have to write this in Java. Uh, now, before we wrote it in Java, um, we were really familiar with Ruby. And our current API at the time was written in Rails. Um, so of course, it was slow. Um, so we decided, well, let's try it in Sinatra. Um, so we wrote it in Sinatra. Started out, you know, maybe about 50, 80 milliseconds. Um, did some optimizations, a lot of caching. Got it down to about uh, 20 milliseconds. So, um, so pretty fast, but we still needed another component um, to the system. Um, we needed to be able to throttle. Uh, because you know um, what we are, what, what our stack was doing was taking um, a query and querying multiple data sources and returning it. And if someone were trying to um, you know DOS attack us, we would be screwed. So um, we needed this throttling layer. And I was thinking, okay, now this we're probably going to have to write in Java. We're not going to be able to do this in in Ruby. Um, and a coworker of mine said, hey, uh, Jeff, have you heard of Node? And this was about a year and a half ago. And I said, um, well, I've kind of heard about it. It's kind of JavaScript on the server side, right? Um, not sure why I would use that. Uh, love to write in Ruby. And um, he said, well, it's supposed to be fast. Um, you know, Chrome is fast. Use the V8 engine. It's like, OK, I'll check it out. Um, so the first thing I did was I went home and I ported over this um, this one project called uh, MochiScript that um, we'd been using uh, to do all our client side, you know, web browser, JavaScript. And um, I ported from C to um, Node. And it turns out that um, C plus Ruby um, is not actually faster than just Node. Um, and I was really impressed. So uh, I said, OK, you know what? We're going to write the prototype for the throttler um, in Node. And, and we'll see what happens. Uh, so we did that. And um, because it was evented and because we used a lot of caching in terms of um, counters and all that, and I'll talk to you more about that later. It's called Tempo. Um, it, was, it was really easy to write. Um, turns out to be trivial. And um, so you know. We decided, OK, well, we'll just put this in production. This thing is, is taking like 0 to 2 milliseconds per request. Um, and so now we had this 2 millisecond request that, that was doing OAuth. It was doing authentication. It was doing throttling. It was doing a lot of stuff. And it, it was coming back in 2 milliseconds. And our API was, made our API look really bad because that was you know, 25 milliseconds. So we said, hey, why don't we just write the API in Node? You know, we always plan to write it in Java, but let's just write it in Node. Um, so it turns out that only took us about two weeks to port that all over. Um, once we ported it over, um, all of a sudden we're less than 10 milliseconds. So our goal was 30 milliseconds, and we're three times that speed. Um, and now um, our latest version, actually, which we will probably release in a month, um, we're down to two milliseconds for the whole stack. Um, so yeah, um, Node's been really good to us. We've been using it for over a year in production. Um, we use it, like I said, for uh, throttling, API. Um, and we use it for the dashboard, which I'll talk to you guys more about later. Um, we also use it uh, a lot for internal tools. Um, it turns out to be a really good tool when we're dealing with a lot of uh, big data stuff, which Factual does a lot. OK, so here's our dashboard. Um, there's probably some sensitive information here, but I'm not sure if you could read it. Um, you know, right here, we could see on the right side um, come some sample requests coming in in the past uh, you know, 10 seconds. You can see um, which users are hitting us the most, which resources they're accessing. You can even see um, what the performance is like for each user, for our top you know, 10 users. Um, 
So this really enables us to uh, figure out um, what our user experience is and also enables us to, um, to correct uh, uh, problems in our system. Uh, also, the CEO and, and marketing and product love it because um, now they can go and brag, they can show their clients, you know, this is what's going on at Factual. Um, so, today I'm going to talk to you about three things. Um, MochiScript, which is kind of the language um, we've been writing Node in, and we've been writing all our JavaScript in for the past few years. Um, Tempo, uh, which is a, another Node package that helps us do the throttling, also helps us um, keep a lot of statistics in memory. And then Upbeat, which is um, a health checker slash dashboard, and I'll explain that later. So uh, MochiScript, uh, I call it JavaScript dessert. Um, what is it? It's kind of like CoffeeScript, but it's not, not that much. It's, it's, it's a lot fewer features. It is JavaScript. So any JavaScript you write is MochiScript, and it will work in MochiScript. Um, we've been using it for four years. Uh, and it works in web browsers, um, Node and Ruby. So you can actually compile this in your Rails app um, and run it on the client side, um, as well as you know, Express. And you can use it on server side Node. Uh, now here's how you would use it. Um, you just require MochiScript, um, require an app, and if that file has a .ms extension, just like CoffeeScript, if, you know, um, it'll just run. So now you can define a class like that, um, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Whoa, this doesn't look good. Okay, um, sorry, uh, I thought I'd have a higher resolution here, but um, you know, on the left side, this is JavaScript, um, and I don't know, how many of you guys actually do uh, object-oriented JavaScript? Okay, uh, and how many of you guys use like prototype or, or some class that does the OO glue and whatnot? You just you use dot prototype? So th this is how you do it on the left side. Um, so one night, uh, I was doing this a lot. We we're, we we're doing a sprint and I just got tired of the syntax. Um, so I created the syntax on the right. Um, sorry, it looks kind of convoluted. Maybe I can. Does that work? No, all right. Um, oh yeah, better. All right, so, um, so I created the syntax on the right. And what, what it does is it um, more or less changes it to what's on the left. And along with that, we added um, inheritance, um, mix-ins, just like Ruby, um, member variables, uh, static methods. Um, and even uh, static methods are inheritable unlike in Java. Any question about the syntax? No? Okay. Um, here's how you would do, um, you iterate over an array. Um, I borrowed this syntax from uh, Perl. Oh, question? Um, so the question is, why, why don't I use ECMA 5? Yeah. Um, because we had to make it um, compatible with all browsers. So uh, this is not just for Node. This is for all browsers. OK, um, and anonymous functions. A lot of times, uh, we have to create these um, lambdas or anonymous functions. Um, so I created this uh, lispy type syntax. And on the bottom is just um, the anonymous function invocation, which um, I don't know if you guys use this, but uh, it's a good way to create a scope. And uh, here docs. Um, this is borrowed again from Ruby and Perl. 
And so this comes in handy when you're doing a lot of, um, now I know we talked about um, text-based templating yesterday, but um, it comes in handy when you're dealing with um, heavy uh, client-side um, apps where uh, you need to you know, dynamically create this HTML. So yeah. anyways, there's more syntax. Um, you, know, you, can, you can go to the site and, and read about it. Um, a lot of people were asking, you know, uh, why did you create this? Um, have you heard of CoffeeScript? Yes, I've heard of CoffeeScript. Um, this was created a long time ago. Um, I was kind of debating on whether to show this today. Um, it's not meant to, to rival CoffeeScript. It's just meant to make writing JavaScript a little easier. That's all. OK, tempo. Um, now, like I said, uh, the first product that we created in Node was um, a throttler, right? So what throttling is is um, you want to be able to limit your users to maybe a thousand requests per minute. Okay, so um, Tempo gave us uh, the ability to do that, and we open sourced that package. Um, you can think of the uh, design as kind of a sliding window of time and and um, encounters. Um, as one of my coworker calls it, it's a conveyor belt. Um, yeah, and it basically allows for more than just throttling. You can use it for statistics, but um, our, our primary use case was for throttling. So um, here's how you would uh, in, invoke um, a tempo timed counter. Uh, you give it a per, which is um, right here, it's five seconds. So that's five seconds each bucket, and you give it 12 buckets, and that means it's going to account for one minute of data flowing through. Um, and then in this um, Express app here, you can just say, you can create a middleware that just increments um, a path and, and the counters. So you can find out how many times um, a URL has been hit over the past minute. And here's kind of the. Um, upbeat representation of this. So as you can see, um, you know, the, on the right is the, um, the most current, and on the end, that's what's happened in the past minute. So as you can see, the stats are just kind of flowing in, and um, it's reporting it you know, every few seconds. OK, um, so. In Tempo, there's several ways to persist your data. Uh, we use Redis. Um, we love Redis F Actual. Uh, my boss says, uh, if you're not using Redis, you might be doing something wrong. Actually, says, he says, you are doing something wrong, but I'm being nice. Um, so um, in, in um, Tempo, you can push data. So if you're right only, if you don't care about actually accessing the data, you can just constantly um, push it to Redis. Uh, you can pull data if you're, you're just read-only, you only care about um, actually seeing the data. And you can call sync, which does both. And sync is important because if you're creating a throttler and you have multiple processes um, or you know, multiple machines, and they all need to have updated data, you can um, run this sync command. Um, you can run it you know, just like this. On the bottom, we're syncing every three seconds. And here on top, we're throttling the user um, by their ID. Does this make sense? No. Yes. I see some yes. Um, and there are several pre-configured um, tempos, so you can do by minute, hour, day, and week. And this is what Upbeat uses, so it reports stats um, in those time periods. For instance, a day, um, you would have one hour um, buckets and 24 hours of them. Um, any questions about tempo? Um, so upbeat. Um, let me explain the justification we have for writing upbeat. Um, so in a very simple stack, you have, um, you'd have two services, right? Uh, service A could be your web service. Um, 
Service B could be a database, it could be uh, your search server or whatever. Um, obviously this doesn't scale, you need more machines um, to, to scale and have availability. So, you know, you put a load balancer in between. Pretty simple. Um, but this in itself is not enough. Um, you want to have health checks. Now, the reason you, you want to have health checks is because, um, for instance, your search server might be up, but it might not have the data you expect it to have. Um, so you have to be smarter with your health checks. Um, so they should be complete. You should do them often. So I think we do ours once every three seconds or once every five seconds. Um, you know, maybe sometimes you need it even once every second to make sure that the service is up. Um, and they could be expensive. Um, so one of the problems we ran into um, at Factual is we were in, for the API, um, we use EC2. Now we have our own colo and that's where we do a lot of our Hadoop and, and number crunching. But um, out on EC2, that's where we host our API. Uh, one of the problems with EC2 is that they don't give you low level access to the network. So you can't play games like have two load balancers and, and have one take over the other um, immediately. So what we did was we pretty made, much made every machine a load balancer. Now, this seems kind of crazy, especially with the number of health checks you're doing. Um, all of a sudden, you're doing n squared number of health checks, and that could bring your system down. And the reason why we're able to do this is because we created um, Upbeat. Now, what Upbeat does is um, I call it a surrogate health checker. So what that means is um, this Upbeat makes sure, make sure that your service B is up. So it'll do whatever it thinks it's necessary. So you might configure it to um, make sure the service has um, network connectivity, um, database is running, database has data in it, um, the web app works, um, and it's responding in, um, in a good amount of time. And then it caches that. Now, all the other machines outside of this machine can hit Upbeat instead of that actual service, and, um, and Upbeat will respond, respond really quickly. You know, it'll, it'll handle thousands per second. So um, this is the original reason why we created Upbeat. Um, then we started thinking, hey, um, well, we need a UI for this because we want to be able to just log into a server, or I mean, visit a server from a web browser and see if this service is not up, what's down? You know, what, part, what part's not working? So we created a UI. And we're like, hey, you know what? Actually, there's a lot of um, valuable information with these health checks. It's telling us how certain parts of your system are performing. So that, in addition with Tempo, allowed us to chart our performance over time. So then we decided, OK, well, you know what? We're going to turn this into a dashboard. So here's what it looks like. <coughs> so um, this is the Upbeat dashboard. Um, now, keep in mind, this is uh, beta, because we've, we've taken um, what we have now, and we've integrated with um, the new Upbeat. So um, yeah, this is what the default um, Upbeat looks like. And so you can see, uh, yeah, we have one service that's down right now. OK, so to run Upbeat, you just install it um, with NPM. Uh, you'd probably want to do install-g and um, run Upbeat, and you pass in a config file. And from this config file, it'll know how to do all the health checks. Uh, here's an example of the config file. So above, you just say, you give it a port number if you want the dashboard. Um, you can also run Upbeat without a dashboard, and you can connect to, you can use the server directly. And then if you want to actually persist the data, um, you, you, know, you have a, uh, a place there called sync, and you give it the Redis um, address and port. 
Now, in services right here below, um, here I have Google. Uh, and what I'm doing is testing two things. I have a, a sensor called www, and I'm using uh, an HTTP strategy. So what it's doing is it's hitting that URL, um, and you can define how often you want to hit it. And if that comes back with anything less than a 400, it considers it good. Otherwise, it's down. Um, and then below that is connection. So that's using the TCP strategy, uh, and it just tries to connect to port 80. So here's what this looks like. Um, here's www. So as you can see, um, that green up top, that means uh, you know, the Google home site, homepage is, is working, which I think 15 minutes ago, ah, see. There were some failures down there. Um, sorry, this is the past hour. Um, the blue line is the response time. Uh, the yellow below, that's the, uh, the slow requests. So you can actually define what's considered to be a slow request and what's considered to be a fast request. Um, I'll explain more about that later. Um, and here's just connecting to the port. So um, what was weird is I was able to connect to the port, uh, you know, almost, um, I, I guess, you know, I didn't have one single failure connecting to that port, but um, I couldn't get any data from it. Uh, um, any questions about these graphs? Which, uh, which real time party converge in this port? This one happens to use uh, LE chart. L? Yeah, E L Y chart. Um, we use, for, for our dashboard, we use Google. Uh, the reason why I, I used um, LE chart for upbeat is because uh, you can't, Google's not always accessible in China. So, um, and they don't let you actually, you know, have a standalone um, charting solution. So you would, you would recommend Google charts? Uh, yeah, when, if you can get away with Google charts and not, I mean, it's just, Simple to use, um, and it's full featured. Uh, LE charts is great, but um, you know the, the Google ones look a little nicer, in my opinion. Out of the box. Um, any other questions? <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over this. I thing. have a good question. Oh. Oi。呃,我我看你這個好像都是連通性的測試,就是呃有沒有那個服,就是能加代碼然後測試這個服務是不是正常。小哥給翻一下。I uh, uh, no, 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 I didn't. I almost did. I understood 30% of it. So, you know, does it support a code snippet for, you know, uh, for, for us to write some plugin for your upbeat? Because we want to monitor the, uh, our performance of the service. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, uh, I'm going to show that um, in a bit. Yeah, good question. Sorry. Um, yeah, we were just complaining about the firewall um, in there and um, forgot to mention this. Um, so you guys have to deal with the great firewall here, and it's kind of a pain here. But um, what you do have is really good cough syrup. Um, so I, I just took some cough syrup right before this, and um, I would, you know, I would put that over my pancakes and eat it. It's, it's, um, so, anyways. Um, okay. So here's what I was talking about um, uh, earlier: stats. So um, Upbeat has services and stats, and stats is kind of what we added at a later time because uh, we realized we want to be able to track more than just responses and health checks, right? So um, what these stacks, stats allow you to do is um, start um, posting data to Upbeat, arbitrary data. So in this case, um, I have this middleware, and what it's doing is um, it's just posting stats for uh, uh, 
the URLs that are accessed. It's keeping track of every URL that's hit and it's incrementing a counter. Um, by the way, this increment here, um, it's not posting it to Redis right away. You just tell it when to sync and that's when it'll flush out the data. Um, so here's what that, this looks like. This is the same um, page I showed you guys earlier. Um, but this is a custom chart now. Um, this is posted by uh, the mock server that I created. Uh, and um, all this traffic is being generated actually by the health checks. So you can see um, the top there uh, in blue is the most hit one. Uh, that's called slash fast slash good. Um, and then uh, the slow one in yellow is the least hit one. So uh, I guess does that answer your question? That's how you would integrate it with Node. Um, Now I realize not everyone has um, or is using Node in production. Uh, so what we did is we allowed we allow you to post to um, the Upbeat server as well. So you can post uh, this data and um, you can learn more about that on in, in the uh, the README file. But um, so I created a little Sinatra app in the back end that um, is just responding to one, two, and three. And this is making an Ajax request. So I'm just clicking on this stuff here. And uh, there, now you see this data come in. Like I can start hitting, uh, let's see, three is, uh, let's see, two is red. So I'm gonna start hitting two a few times. And you see it just come in. So now you can start charting um, arbitrary data. Uh, we do plan on supporting more than just this graph here. We do plan on supporting pie charts and whatnot. But um, for now, this is uh, pretty much it. And here's what it looks like over the past hour. All right, um, so here's Upbeat in all its glory. Um, so let me show you a sample sensor here. So um, this is a, what I call a reliable service. Um, so the, the mock server is programmed to fail every once in a while, so it gives you interesting stats. Um, but what you're seeing here is um, that those reds are failures. So you're seeing way more green than red. So um, it's sort of reliable. Um, the black dots are timeouts. So you know there are a few timeouts there. Um, and again, the blue is the response time. And this is what it looks like over the past hour. Um, let me show you a unreliable one. So uh, this one's programmed to fail 50% of the time, and that's kind of what you're seeing now. That purple line going across is on the bottom are fast requests and the yellow line are slow requests. Oops. And let's see, uh, what else can I show you? Um, here's the stats, here's the buttons I was hitting. Um, and the URLs. Okay, well, um, so actually, um, this is the dashboard again. This is what um, we have at Factual, and um, hopefully we're gonna be able to get closer to this as we work on um, Upbeat and eventually replace our dashboard with um, Upbeat. And uh, here are the links to all the projects I've been talking about. Um, so that's it, uh, I'm open for questions right now.
You just mentioned uh, quickly that you cache the Redis increments locally before flushing yeah. them on the root. So why is that? You didn't why, why do I cache them locally? Yeah. Um, just so you're not constantly um, creating this IO to, to Redis. So um, you, know, you, you can keep track of you know, five second increments um, and, and then you just flush those. So you, you know, if you have a thousand requests, you're still only making a constant number of requests to Redis. So person. were you having performance problems? Uh, that uh, we weren't, no. but it's just um, optimization. We didn't. Yeah, it's an optimization because you know you don't want. Uh, I didn't want to create um, a linear amount of traffic to our. Uh, you know the traffic we're getting to Redis. Cool. Right. So. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, there's. Question here. Um, so my question is just you've got uh, so we talked a lot about the front end of factual right, but you guys it seems like your core business is you crunch some data and do some analysis on it. So I'm just kind of curious how that interacts with Node. I assume that piece is not written in Node, but or is um, it maybe. So uh, yeah, I didn't mention this. Um, so at Factual, we kind of uh, we're kind of a polyglot um, company. Uh, we work with uh, Hadoop, Java, um, Node, Ruby, Clojure, um, and uh, we use Mongo, MySQL, Postgres, um, and HBase. Am I oh Redis? <laughs> so, um, so a lot of those technologies, um, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on using the right tool, and we don't really shy away from technology. Um, so a lot of uh, the number crunching and um, and uh, the you know the summarization, which is expensive, uh, is done offline with with a Hadoop cluster. Um, we do use Node for things like um, being able to pull, uh, uh, being able to visualize this data and allowing people um, to to properly uh, maintain to to analyze the quality and um, improve the quality, like. You know, maybe uh, AT&T should be ATT, or ATT should be AT&T, um, and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, that's yeah, that's pretty much what we do in our colo. And then our API is is um, served in EC2. So have you ever looked at? Uh, I'm just curious if anyone's ever tried this to do like Hadoop streaming with Node. Like you know, I think there's some interface to like Python and these other languages. I'm not sure if that would work well with Node or not. Um, I actually did pitch it. Um, to uh, kind of our, our DSL language. Uh, the first DSL language we had was, was in JavaScript, and we used uh, Rhino to do that in Java. Um, and I kind of pitched Node to them, um, but uh, we decided that we didn't really want to marry ourselves to a single language, so uh, we moved over to um, being able to use Clojure, Ruby, and, and JavaScript to do all our number crunching. And we have to use Java to do that, and not not know. Hi, Wintima. Yo, Wintima. No question. Can I do a quick? Uh, can I take a? Can Can everyone that lives in Shanghai raise your hand? Please. So I want to send I want to send this video to to, to my boss. Who, who, <laughs> okay. we, we have a hardest time finding engineers here, and um, I want to show them that, that there are engineers. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Oh, Boris, this is for you. Then the engineers are more. This is a bit too honest. So, anyways, yeah, it's, just try to convince him that that we can. You men, very quickly will come to Shanghai. I know. Okay, it's yeah. done. Okay, 好，谢谢 Jeff。